Welcome back, everyone, to another new episode of Grow Your Path to Wellness. If you missed our last episode, um, our last released one, we had Ken, Kim Laughlin with us, and she kind of spoke on the topic of the importance of communication and workplace wellness. So we know we touch on each of the eight dimensions of wellness, and Kim really honed in very well on communication and the role that, that plays in our places of employment and morale and productivity, all the things. So, but this week we have Lilby, I'm going to apologize now because I do not want to butcher your name. We probably hear this all the time, but uh, we have Libby Villa Vincenzo. Very good. Very good. I got it. Yay. So (laughs) she's with us today and we're super excited and we're going to be talking about sustaining your nonprofit. So thank you so much for your time on this Sunday morning, Libby. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. All right, Libby, I obviously have gotten to know you so well. Libby has been um, a major support of our nonprofit recently and supporting some wellness events and helping us get, uh, you know, light on those and be able to provide those. So, so thankful for Libby. Um, But for everyone else that hasn't had a chance to get to know you, please tell us all about yourself, your background, and how you kind of got into this world of nonprofits and why you're so passionate about it. Oh, thank you. Well, um, I go by Libby V, by the way, Kelsey, so you never have to worry about that name again. Um, And that really came from um, when I taught middle school. My students, of course, didn't, couldn't say my last name or didn't want to even try, so they called me Miss V. Um, So anyway, um, so that's part of my background is uh, teaching middle school. So I accidentally, like many of us in the nonprofit field, accidentally ended up in, a, in nonprofit work. Um, I uh, I was teaching school. I took time off to have a baby. And I realized while I was out on leave that I really wanted to work with adults during the day. I love kids. I l- love everything about them. Um, but I really, I had that aha light bulb moment. And it just so happened my best friend was working in a nonprofit organization that served people who were unhoused. Um, and at she, there was a job opening and it was flexible and part-time and all those things. And so I was ready to go back into the workforce and um, she just said, come work with me. And so I did. <laughs> and I, I just realized at that point, you know, these are my people, uh, nonprofit people are my people. Um, they care about, others and want to make the world a better place. And there's nothing better than that. So I stuck um, and have been in the world ever since. Um, And so because I'm an educator at heart and a learner at heart, I really um, love, I kind of fell into some consulting work as well and fell in love with that. Just really helping nonprofit folks to be um, more efficient, more effective, of course, but also just like not lose their mind. You know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a big job. And I mean that literally it's talk about wellness, right? There's a lot of burnout in the nonprofit sector. And so I'm glad that you are tackling that. Thank you so much, Libby. You know, you know, the roles. Um, And before we get into this awesome conversation, can you just give like a basic understanding of what a nonprofit is versus a for-profit? Sure. Um, sure. I have a lot of people um, in my networking that are like, oh, huh, why did you choose to go the nonprofit route? Or, or, you know, I'll have like business coaches that'll recommend certain like ways of doing business. And I'm like, yeah, I can't really do it that way because I'm a nonprofit. And so I think just right. even clarity for our, you know, general person out there in the world listening, what is the difference? What, what, makes a nonprofit at all. Well, nonprofit, the 501c3 structure is an IRS structure. It's a tax structure. And so the difference between a 501c3 nonprofit organization and a for-profit organization is that um, many people think that it's that uh, nonprofits can't have a profit. um, And that is so commonly misunderstood. That's not it at all. In fact, nonprofits should have a net at the end of every year to build their nest egg and rainy day fund. And, you know, God forbid we have another COVID, but, you know, a fund that kind of will see them through for a few months if things get bad. The only difference is that they can't give that profit. And we don't really use that word in the nonprofit world, except in the title, (laughs) nonprofit. Um, 
they can't they can't distribute it among their board members or they can't distribute it among any um stakeholders you know um we don't really have stockholders right in the nonprofit sector and um so that's the difference uh that's the true difference of course um any company can do good right and and so that's not what separates nonprofits from for profits um and there are different tax structures and kinds of things in corporations that other businesses have where they're they're really um focused on doing good but they're not a nonprofit they might be a b corp or you know some type of social enterprise but anyway that's the difference no thank you for that because i think in our I guess I can only, from my lens, right, I'm coming from, and in my background, I'm coming from a community mental health setting. Mm -hmm. Now I'm in a for-profit, I'm in my own private practice, which is a LLC, you know, structure, but Mm -hmm. it's always interesting having this conversation with people who don't quite know, uh, you know, what these Mm -hmm. things are and how they're different, because I think there's this expectation that if, when you hear nonprofit, you hear like full-blown, like bleeding heart, you don't, you can't make anything to to live off of. You're just doing this right. out of the goodness of your heart. And I'm like, not necessarily. Like there's it's just yeah. the structure. And I think yes. it's yeah. um we're all out. I like how you still said, like it doesn't make somebody out here doing good and versus doing bad. It's like yeah, we're all right. in here for a common yeah. I, ideally we're here to do good and bring value right. to the world. So right. but thank you yeah. for distinguishing yeah. some things. You're welcome. Thanks for asking that question, by the way, Amanda. That's a, that's a very misunderstood. Go ahead. Um, no, you're fine. I know before we started recording, you said that you've been doing a lot of work as far as like board development. And I know mm-hmm. how large of a component, like that's the foundation of mm-hmm. nonprofits. But mm-hmm. can you explain to our listeners, what is the purpose of a board for a nonprofit organization? Yep, for sure. So um, this this often gets misunderstood too. Um, board members are really responsible for a few things. They're responsible. We hear the term fiduciary, right? That boards have fiduciary obligations, and that is part of it. I mean, they're responsible for making sure that the organization stays solvent and is sustainable and financially secure, right? So they are responsible for that. But they're also responsible for... Um, excuse me, knows. Um, they're responsible for um, making sure that the, organi- the organization's mission is commonly held up by everyone, right? So the board sets the direction of the organization through things like, you know, vision and a strategic plan and things like that. But ultimately, they're responsible for making sure that the purpose of the organization is front and center and is always the point of everything that's done, right? So that the, everybody's in alignment. Yes, this is where we're headed. This is the work that we're doing. This is the purpose of our organization. It's why we exist. Um, and they're really um, also responsible for making sure that uh, the organization itself is compliant. So it's compliant with IRS regulations, with state laws, um, because all nonprofit organizations have to be incorporated in their state as well as have the IRS designation. So they have to make sure that they're abiding by all those regulations. Um, And, you know, people often ask, is the board, is part of their responsibility fundraising? It absolutely is, because that's hardwired in that fiduciary obligation. So um, board members should be, you know, giving and and helping in that scares some people, both board and staff, but um, it's, it, they can do it in a way that they, that is meaningful to them and that they like, they don't, everybody doesn't have to ask. And that's what board members always think is, do I have to ask for money? I'm, I don't want to do that. Um, so anyway, that, uh, that was a little bit of a meandering. You just saw my ADHD brain, right? Like people without ADHD tell a story from A to B. I tell one from A, B, C, D, E. Yeah. All the way around. 
<laughs> I was with friends yesterday and uh, I was, that was happening with a friend that is also mm -hmm. neurospicy and another friend off to the side was like, what is happening over here? You have gone from this to this to this. And I'm like, yeah, but neither one of us are annoyed or irritated. We're both just like, yeah, we'll get there eventually. <laughs> but oh my goodness. Is, the thing Libby too, is that you're so passionate about this and you're so knowledgeable and so wise in this area and you have so much to share. And so it's hard to just like give the surface when you know it goes so much further beyond that too I know it's always my struggle right it's like there's so much to talk about about even just like this topic of, of boards like it's so much um mm -hmm. so I try to fit in as much as I can but I'll try to tell it more I'll try to answer more directly okay we're good we're good we love the conversation <laughs> good and so I think the other thing too is um it's interesting I don't think I've shared this with you Libby uh but you know I'm we're celebrating five years in November for our congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, and it's so funny because now in my community, like in the, all the network I've been doing, people come to me now and like people that want to start a nonprofit or are thinking about it, they're like, oh, you should talk to Amanda. And I've become like <laughs> the nonprofit, like <laughs> consultant, like wisest one of the group. And I'm like, don't look at me. Like I'm still figuring it out. And so uh, just like one of those things that you don't know what you don't know, it was a Board. You know, when you Google mm -hmm. how to start a nonprofit, they say, hey, you know, you need three names on a piece of paper for the government. They don't say why right. you need that or what they're for or right. Like, exactly. It's, and, and, and so, you know, it was a couple buddies and, you know, hey, like mm -hmm. friends, colleagues, can you can we do this together? And then yes. it was me quarterly just updating yeah. them on what was happening. Right. And it wasn't actually a true right. board. And so I think that's just so valuable for you to share that information for anyone that's thinking about starting a nonprofit and also for people yes. that might be interested in starting um, or joining and getting involved on a board. So yep. what are things yep. um, other than like people that, you know, have oversight for fiduciary responsibility and people that are wanting mm -hmm. to share your mission with the community? What are other things that you look for in building a board or board members? Thank you for that question. And I, I do want to put a pin in something you said, which is, you know, which is sort of like, um, it, you know, you get those first three board members, right? And that's a goal. It's like, whoa, I've got my three board members that I have to have the officers, you know, when, that, that the state mandates, right? And so, um, but it, it goes beyond that. And, and it's connected to something you said, Kelsey, earlier, um, you know, this misnomer of that nonprofits are, you know, don't pay employees and we're just we just work for nothing because we're nonprofit people and we're bleeding hearts and we want to help and all that stuff you know uh, nonprofits are businesses first of all and they need to operate like businesses and so what happens and i am really closing the loop i'm, I'm coming back around to your to answer your question Anna. um but but what comes up for me when we have this conversation is the scarcity versus abundance mindset and it affects board it affects board recruitment because we have been, we do have this culture of that scarcity, right? We do have that mindset in a lot of nonprofit organizations. And so um, what happens a lot with recruiting board members is, is what you said, Amanda, it's like, okay, let's just get people. Will you be on the board? Okay, great. Um, now what do we do with you? Right? Like, we gotcha. Um, what do we do? And so I would, uh, I think there, there are kind of two things that have to happen. One, you have to start recruiting in a different way um, and bringing people onto the board in a different way. Um, so you, you have to sort of start where you're at, but also build some structures and some communications and things like that, processes and systems that make sure that when you recruit the next board members, you recruit them in, in the right way. Um, but also with the board members that you have, you know, if you've got board members that were recruited in that way, um, I hear a lot of executive directors say my board isn't, my board's not doing anything. My board members aren't being helpful. And it's like, well, how did you recruit them? What did you tell them when you were talking to them about being on the board? And a lot of times it goes to, it goes kind of like this, hey, would you be on my board? Well, what do I have to do to be on the board? Well, we, we have meetings every month. Can you come to a meeting every month? Sure. Okay, you're on, right? And so why are we surprised when all they do is come to the meetings? 
that's what we told them they had to do, right? So it's it's uh, it's kind of a simple fix, but it needs to be deliberate and intentional that we we need to approach this from a mindset of abundance that it's an honor to serve on a nonprofit board. It's an honor to try to help, um, uh, you know, the community, uh, individuals, um, the environment, animals, whatever the cause is, that is, that's an honor. It's an honor to be on a nonprofit board and it's a big job. And we need to make sure that we don't get into that scarcity mindset and and feel like we're lucky if somebody says they'll be on our board, but approach it from the perspective of we need high performing board members who are super committed and passionate about what we do. And we're not going to settle for anything less. Okay. And if that means that you don't have the right number of board members as specified in your bylaws, so what? Nobody's going to pay attention to whether or not you're abiding by that number in your bylaws. But if you bring on people to your board, I'm not saying this to you, but if if, if board members come onto a board and they're not super passionate, you know, and committed and hardworking and really want to make a difference and are clear on their roles and responsibilities, all those things, we're, we're, we're doing a disservice to our organization and things are not going to be as good as they could. Um, and it becomes pl- problematic. Long answer, but that's... That's no, that kind of so what I good, say. Is- Libby. It reminded me, um, and I always go back to this now, even when I'm, you know, working with clients or doing um, training supervision for other social workers to get their independent license or, you know, just talking to people out in the world that what you said is that setting expectations from the beginning is so important. That yes. is that informed yes. consent really is how I see it. Right. Yes. I'm, I'm giving you full yes. informed consent. These are the terms and conditions that you're, that I'm going to give you the fine print yes. to, because I know you're probably not going to read them. I'm going to tell you everything that that is that way when, you know, three months down the road, when my board's not doing anything, it's not that they didn't know what they were supposed to be doing and I didn't give them the tools to right. support that. It's that, you know, they would right. I didn't fully inform them of what that meant. Exactly. And, you know, it, 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 so that's the first piece, right? That's sort of like getting clear. I mean, it's, you wouldn't hire somebody like a lot of board members are recruited to come on the board. And it's kind of a, I mean, it's, it's not very different. And so I tell people you should be um, interviewing and selecting board members and they should be interviewing you and selecting you just like you would for a job. Um, It needs to be that rigorous and, you know, core values are super important too, right? Like if you, you need to make sure you um, articulate what are the core values we need in people in order for them to be the right fit and then look for those as well in board members as well as employees. So, yes. My brain um, thinks in like system, like I'm a, I'm a very um, logical, like if I can figure out what the steps are, I'm good. Like you won't see me, you won't hear from me most of the time unless I have a question. And what comes to my brain is like, I feel like, and I've never set up a, a nonprofit, but what I'm hearing from you two is it feels like you go into it with that scarcity mindset. And I feel like that clouds a lot of things or puts you in like a little place of like survival mode a little bit, trying to set it up. Yes. Like, I don't know what I'm yes. doing and I'm freaking out and that's where I'm mm-hmm. at. But then you don't have all of these things established for yourself and then you're recruiting you know, board member. So what are my core values? What's like a lot of back end work is what my yes, brain was like. It is. There's a lot there before you get to, hey, here's this informed consent. Can you be on my board? Yeah. And a lot of times we get in a hurry, rush it. And then again, scarcity mindset is like, you just feel so good that somebody would actually take an interest in your organization and even say that they would be a board member that you just take them not, you know, without yeah. understanding, right? Whether or not they're a good fit and you're a good fit for them. Yes, that's exactly right. I love the I love the the metaphor or the analogy that you used about sort of um, just survival mode kind of idea, right? I always think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I, at some point in my life, like that just struck me, you know, when I, Psych 101 or something in college, I don't know. I had a crush on my professor. That's probably it. But um, so... <laughs> uh, 
uh, you know, that's that we can't function like that anymore. And, you know, and, and unfortunately, that's been the culture of nonprofits, that's been the culture of the nonprofit sector. And it's, it's really hard to tip that into the next, you know, into like, thriving, right, mm-hmm. from moving to that basic level of, of just survival. Um, and it's hard to do that, but it can start with the board, the board can be huge. And I just want to say that, your board in a nonprofit is it's making or breaking the organization. It is so tied to the success of the organization that it needs careful consideration and we need to do it in a better way because it is absolutely the number one indicator of a nonprofit's success, the board, truly. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's not just a compliance thing like check our bylaws say we need 13 board members. We've got 13 people now, right? It's, it's important. Can we um, just go back a tiny bit real quick? Sorry, I know we Mm -hmm. had another, but um, again, just because I think these things become so second nature for us that we forget the rest of the world doesn't necessarily know them. And something as basic as like scarcity mindset. Can you just kind of like break that down a little bit? Because we see this in therapy often, right? We see this in financial realms. We see this in, it it, it just kind of morphs all throughout our lives. But um, Mm -hmm. can you kind of just like break down what like that scarcity mindset slash like first abundance means and how that can kind of get in the way of things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, when you're operating in a scarcity mindset, you feel like there aren't enough resources to go around. Um, You know, you think in terms of, I shouldn't spend any money or invest any more time in things other than, and in the nonprofit world, I think, I think it might go to this place. And it's, it's, it's not a bad thing. It's, it's, I mean, it's wonderful, but we got to move beyond it too, is this notion of everything we do has to be about helping people, period. All the money we spend, all our activity, we got to help more people because there's a lot of people to help. And like I said, that's a beautiful thing, right? That you want to help as many people as you can. But I think often um, nonprofit folks um, do that at the expense of everything else, including their own well-being, Um, and so, you know, that there's so much burnout in the nonprofit sector. And I think that's why it's like, I've got to put, you know, more than a hundred percent into like helping the people that we serve, you know, and, um, and then I, then I'll have to do the other stuff, doing the, the management of the organization and the leadership of the organization, like in my non, non working hours time. Right. And it that is that is so hardwired into the um, DNA of of nonprofit organizations and the culture that you know it makes it hard to break that cycle. Um, and so nonprofit um, staff are, are and sometimes board even are in like a putting out fires mode. It's just constant crisis and constant. You know they don't they don't take the time or make the space to put in processes and systems because they don't want to, that to them is wasted time, I think a lot. And, and again, it's, it's not that they're, you know, flawed people, the the opposite is true, you know, but it's just part of the culture. It's part of the expectation. And so I think that scarcity mindset, that's part of it. And and the other part of it is is the funding structure for nonprofits. If we told for profits, they'd have to go out and ask for money all the time, like startups do, right? They have to like get investors and stuff to get going most some of the time. But if, if, if other businesses had to function that way, like you have to, you have to raise the money, you know, you have to ask for the, for the money. I mean, mean, they sell stuff obviously, but um, this whole notion of, of, of having to, to be lucky enough, I think in a lot of, times and good enough to get funding um is is really hard and puts a, puts you in that scarcity mindset because you get turned down a lot you're not going to get 100% of the you know you're not going to get the money the 100 100% of the time yeah so whether that be grants or corporate support or corporate sponsorship or individual donations or whatever it is it's it's you know you get you get knows a lot of the time and i think that that makes you know chips away at how you feel about you know whether you're worthy or not of of a gift right of a of a donation so i think all that plays in i think it's a complex thing i i don't think it's real simple um but i think we have to start 
dismantling that. Um, and also we've never paid nonprofit staff what they, what they should be paid in the nonprofit sector. And often you see news articles about just how much, you know, the, the, the president of the American Red Cross is making, or, you know, one of those organizations, big, complex, multi, you know, national, whatever it is, organizations, it's like, well, we don't say that about the president of Citibank, you know, mm -hmm. we don't like, why are this CEO of Citibank? Like, why do we do that? It's, I, I say it's harder to run a nonprofit than it is a for-profit business. There's much more red tape and complexity. Um, and yet we, in this society, we just don't, we don't, va it's, I don't know if it's a value thing, but we just don't think that nonprofit staff should make nearly as much as for-profit staff. We have that it's just part of it. And so I think that adds to it too. It's like, I'm living in scarcity. A, a lot of nonprofit staff are paid a wage that is poverty level. Mm -hmm. uh, it's common. Yeah. And, and I always say like, oh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. No, no, please. I was just going to say, I always say like, I, you know, when I left my job for the first time ever without having another job, when I left nonprofit world, because it was not healthy for me, I was very privileged to do that because many of the people I worked alongside in that one and many others were getting the same benefits that our clients were, right? Like they yes. were getting childcare assistance and food assistance and rental yes. assistance, right? And so they didn't have that privilege to be able to just do that. So, and yeah. then yes, to lay, laying the foundation and how important that is, I will attest mm -hmm. to that because I think many people that do start nonprofits are so passionate and we're so like, we just want to serve uh -huh. and like, you know, it is that bleeding heart. And so for yeah. me, it was like business plan, eh. Like, yes, I know what I want to do. And then before you know it, you know, strategic plan. Ugh, I don't, right. And then before you know it, you're just kind of flailing around because there is no direction. Um, uh, yeah, I love that. Yeah. I ask a lot. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Amanda. Go you're ahead. fine. Finish. Yeah. I was just going to say, I've, I run into a lot of people like you who are super passionate, want to help others. Right. And they're, they're like, I'm thinking about starting a nonprofit organization. And my first question to them is, do you want to run a business? Or do you just want to do whatever it is you want to do, right? So do you want to run a business or do you want to spend your days, you know, helping the people with whatever it is you want to help them with, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it's, you're exactly right. People, they want to start a nonprofit for that purpose to help others, but you have to be able to run, you have to run a business. Um, and that can take up a lot of your time and energy. So sorry, it's, go ahead. It, you're fine. It's super fun too. And then I'll just say, um, after everything you were sharing about nonprofits and how like the old ways of doing things and we're changing that this next, uh, question from Kelsey is directly from my brain. So. I was good. So you can go ahead and ask it, but I can too. Um, and I'd never heard of this. So like I said, I'm not, I haven't been, I've worked in a nonprofit, but I haven't ran a nonprofit as a business right. myself. So how you just distinguish those, but can you share, I know we're kind of limited on time just a little bit, but can you share what a give or get policy is? And oh, yeah. if you are comfortable, like how you feel about that? I'm so passionate about this. Oh my gosh. Thank you for asking. Um, uh, yeah. And then remind me, I want to, I'm going to write a note here. I want to mention one other thing. Um, okay. So I do not like them. And I've been in nonprofit world for a long time. I am not young and um, just young at heart. Um, and I'll tell you, it's, I've, I've gone, I've gone full circle. When I first heard about it, I was like, oh, I don't like that. And then I was like, all right, I get it. We have, you know, we have to have some expectations. And then I, I am a hard no on it. I'm a hard no. Um, I believe that you can you shouldn't, it, I think it's related to scarcity mindset. Compliance is the floor, not the ceiling. So if you're, if you're looking, if you're man recruiting, onboarding, orienting your board from a, you know, more of a compliance thing, like, look, you have to give or get X number of dollars, whatever it is, you know, that's not where you want to land. You want to land. And what I say is use this language instead. We, you, the expectation is that you will help with fundraising in some way. That can be writing thank you notes to donors. It can be uh, meeting with corporations. It can be connecting us with people who might want to be involved with our organization. You have, 
we ask you to do something, but we're going to talk to you about what it is that you want to do in that regard. Um, and then, so that's the getting part, right? And the giving part, what I say, I coach nonprofit leaders and board chairs in what you want to say to the board is we ask you to make a gift. We do. We expect you to make a gift and we want it to be personally meaningful to you. For some people, that's $5 because, and then for other people, it's $5 million. Um, We also, I also encourage that type of approach for for equity and belonging and accessibility and inclusion and all and diversity, all those things, right? All those letters, all the acronym, um, because you want to have people on your board. You should have people on your board who represent your ecosystem. Um, and that means, you know, the people you serve, your staff, you um, the community surrounding you, if you have like a place in the community, right? If you have a physical space that is in community, like you want to represent your ecosystem, you want your board to represent your ecosystem. And so if you say, you know, we have a get give or get policy um, on our board that is, you know, a thousand dollars or whatever it is, I've never seen one less than that. Um, you're going to eliminate a lot of people who who should be on your board and can't be on your board because they don't have those connections to get a thousand dollars and they don't have it to give. So you've just closed the door on so many people who could who are very important um, uh, to your success and and should be on your board. So that's my passionate um, uh, response to that question. Selfishly, I've been wanting to ask you that for a while, and I was like, "This is the mm. perfect opportunity." So, thank yeah. you so much for that. Yeah, and I appreciate yeah, you're welcome. You connecting it to you know DEI um, yeah. because that's so valuable too. I think um, I don't know, like it. It just reminds me of giving in general, and like giving yep. from your heart and giving. You know, like we can't put yeah. a value. I mean, we can put a value on it, but we can't put a value on like someone's commitment to, you know, being a volunteer at the front desk or, you know, putting thank you letters or um, posting, you know, flyers for our events Mm -hmm. all around town, Mm -hmm. right? All of that is giving and um, Mm -hmm. we shouldn't gatekeep, I guess. Exactly. And I, yeah, I will say just, uh, just to uh, clarify. So everybody on the board should give mostly because a lot of foundations ask you what percentage of your board give. Um, and so, you know, uh, if that wasn't a thing, I would say, you know, let people do other things like their time is valuable. They're contributing their time. They should, you know, if, if you recruit them, right, they should be so passionate that they want to give back, right. They want to help your organization. So that's that, that's for that. Um, and then I just want, if I could just for a minute, say, we talked a lot about recruitment and that's really important, but then you have to onboard and orient and educate your board really well and and have board meetings that are meaningful. Flip the script. Most board meetings in nonprofits are boring and they're report outs. So shift it. So most of your board meeting is engaging the board in strategic conversations where you ask them to help you solve a problem. Okay, I'm going to stop because I know our time is almost up. <laughs> no, that's totally okay. I appreciate it. And obviously, like many people we bring on the show, we could just talk all day or create uh-huh. all the series. So obviously, you are welcome back um anytime. Libby, thank, you. thank you so much for being here. Please thank let you. us know where can we find you? Where can we follow you? Feel free to plug anything that you got going on right now. All right. Um libbyv.com, l i b b y v.com is a good place. Um I'm on LinkedIn too if you can even spell that name. Um, and, uh, you know, I put out a newsletter, um, and are doing lots of fun stuff. So let me know. Awesome. And we'll put all that in the show notes so people can find you. Thank you, Libby. And, uh, we'll Uh, have you back again soon. 